I suppose I can start off with some introductions. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to What is Making America So Sick? My name is Rachel Parent. For those of you who don't know me, I am the founder of Kids Right to Know, a nonprofit organization. And I've been a really vocal food safety and environmental activist for many years now. So I'm really excited to be hosting this panel here today. And I'm also really excited for all the amazing knowledge and important uh, information that we're going to leave with. So we've all heard of COVID-19 by now, how it spread like wildfire in the US. And a lot of this loss and tragedy is related to underlying health conditions that we are seeing so dramatically. Um, according to the National Health Council, chronic diseases affect approximately 40% of the US population. And those are only the citizens who are really aware of their conditions. So we have to begin to ask ourselves, why are more and more people facing these health vulnerabilities? What is causing so many of these underlying health conditions, neurological conditions? And that's what we're here to do today, to answer these tough questions, ask why is America so sick right now? How did we get to this point? And what can we all do to stop this? So I'd like to jump right into it and introduce our guests here today. Uh, we have Dr. Shen Hong Lu, who is an MD and a PhD. She is a practicing licensed physician and the owner of Mount Shasta Integrative Medicine in Northern California. Her focus is on the root cause of chronic illness and what can be done to fix it. Dr. Liu is certified by the American Internal Medicine Board. She is also a member of the American Academy for Environmental Medicine, a recipient of the Merck Young Investigator Award, and a director of the Scientific Board of Nutrition International Advanced Studies. So it is such an honor to have you uh, Dr. Liu, and I'm really excited for the conversation that we'll be having. Uh, we also today have Dr. Michelle Perro, and she is an MD, a Yale graduate, has been practicing, pediatri uh, practicing pediatrician uh, for 35 years in many aspects of healthcare for children, including emergency care, integrative uh, health care. Dr. Perro really transformed her clinical practice to include pesticide and health advocacy, educating the public about the dangers of our food system and environmental toxins, which is so important now more than ever. She is the author of What is Making Our Children So Sick? And she is presently involved with the medical education and patient supervision at Gordon Medical Associates in Marina County, as well as nationwide lecture on integrative medicine. So we have two incredible experts here today. And Dr. Liu and Pero, uh, both being MDs, have seen thousands of patients combined. Between the two of them, over the last six decades, of, uh, they have had incredible amount of clinical experience. And really the crux of what they've discovered is that patients are chronically ill and the root cause of medicine is not practiced. We really have a blind spot in medicine where as much as modern medicine is treating the symptoms, it's not looking at what's really causing these issues, the root causes. Um, the, we've, both of them have looked at the role of environmental toxicants and their effects on the gut brain axis. And that's what we're here to talk about today. What is really making America so sick? What can we do about it? Um, so I know Dr. Liu will be talking more in terms of what is affecting adults. Dr. Perel will be talking more about what is affecting children. Um, so I will start off with Dr. Liu. What really is making Americans so sick as of right now? Uh, that's a very good, uh, very, very good question. Of course, uh, we all have uh, our favorite enemy, right? Or explanation. Um, I think one of the topic I want to conversation with, I want to have is, you know, by living in China for 25 years and then uh, coming to the United States in the late eighties and watching the unfolding of chronic disease. And I have some pretty good idea about the main uh, causation. It's not just association. I do truly believe these are our main causes. Number one is really about the um, toxicants. Toxicants are uh, not created by our body, it's created by man uh, or our environment outside of our body. And some of the toxicants are uh, able to be e excreted and detoxified and biotransformed, but most of the man-made chemicals are um, you know, new to our body. Our body's uh, detox system oftentimes are overwhelmed 
And that's really something I want to point it out is one of the major causes of chronic disease in this country. Um, when I travel to China and the, the other part of the world, I realize it's really a spreading disease. Uh, we are the leader, unfortunately, uh, leading this chemical pollution to even the developing countries. And Dr. Uh, Michelle Perro probably can relay that uh, since she travels also extensively to Africa. The second root cause is stress and modern radiation. Um, you know, we all remember, you know, when I first came to Shmang Shasta, um, you know, being the ICU attendant, um, attending a physician, I was carrying a pager. I did not have cell phone. And that's just in 1998. So uh, you can see a, a accelerated another class of disease related to multi-system stress um, are contributing to our increase in chronic disease too. So stress and toxicants and modern radiation are really the main causation of this tremendous trend. Um, I think uh, that's just a quick answer to you. Thank you uh, so much for sharing that. And I guess my next question then is to Michelle, the same thing, but what is making children so sick? We see a huge epidemic of especially neurological issues in children. Uh, and it is really becoming more and more common, almost considered a normal. What is the cause of that? Yeah, Rachel, thank you. And Shanhong, thank you for your answer. So when we look at kids' health, we look at many factors that are making kids sick. But what I like to focus on and what I have been focusing on for the past, I don't know, maybe 20 years is the effect of food. And there are two things that are happening. When we, we look at neuroinflammation nation and, a, and a, a sick America, sick Canada too, is there's something that happened. When I start, one of the biggest things that shocked my world was the rising rate of neurocognitive disorders um, neurodevelopmental disorders affecting children. And the biggest one that I was worried about was autism, ASD, autistic spectrum disorder. Several things happened. In 1988, um, there was a big change. And that's when we started seeing autism rates rise, for example. We, we started taking biosolids or bio sludge that we used to dump in the ocean because we used to feel that the solution to pollution is dilution. We used to take all this sewerage from humans, from, from factories, et cetera, and put it in the ocean and we had a toxic sediment. In 1988 in the US, we took all those biosolids, there's nothing bio about those solids, and we started putting them on farmland as fertilizer. And so now we have this toxic soup fertilizing our crops made up of heavy metals, pesticides, infectious agents, et cetera. It can turn into dust and blow everywhere. The second big thing that happened to our children's health with a, a lens on neuro, neuroinflammation, neurocognitive dysfunction, are GMOs and pesticides. And that happened between 1996 and 1998. GMOs and their associated pesticides were introduced. We've been on the hamster wheel ever since eating increased doses of glyphosate-based herbicides, which we will dig into a little bit here during this conversation, and other pesticides. And remember, you do not eat a GMA, GMO alone, you eat it with its associated herbicide. And the people need to understand that these glyphosate-based herbicides have a lot of toxic poop in with them. That's a pediatric word, it's my favorite as people who know me know that I love poop. And it is something that is fat soluble, it's called POEA, it's a surfactant, it makes glyphosate more toxic. What's the most toxic thing? And what we worry about, about these toxic factors, are these pollutants are, that are most toxic are most soluble in fat. They're not water soluble. So although glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup that we're all eating every day, whether you eat organic or not, it's inorganic too, unfortunately, has a surfactant in it, in it which is a tallow made from fat, and that makes it more fat soluble and they are the really nasty ones. So this is what's making our kids sick among many other things, because remember kids eat a lot, especially babies, they can eat every two or three hours. And so food and what we've done to it or food like ingredients as my colleague and co-author, Dr. Adams like to write about. So that is my long quick answer. Amazing. And um, 
I think what I want to jump to next is some of the uh, statistics, because I think many times we don't often realize how sick people around us are or how sick America really is. So Dr. Liu, can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening with your patients? Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm going to sh uh, share with you a few slides, okay? So, so one thing I want people to realize is um, we're actually facing some of the most challenging time. We're seeing a consequence of 20 years of poisoning. And because um, this is the problem with environmental disease, it doesn't happen today after you are exposed yesterday. It has accumulation time and a causing the overburden of our body. So the 10, 20 year delay is what we're seeing. So right now we're seeing 59% um, of Americans, right? This is the majority of Americans already have formally diagnosed of one chronic condition. Uh, more than one out of three already have three chronic conditions. And some of them don't even consider themselves sick when they're taking antidepressant, uh, blood pressure pill, and cholesterol pill, which is really kind of sad because they are so used to being treated um, with a pharmaceutical drug to address their chronic condition. They consider themselves being healthy. So the disease trend here, according to the, um, the RA, ND Corporation evaluation and prediction is they, uh, they predicted by 2030, which is not that far away, more than half Americans will be having uh, pretty much millions. This is a million, Once 171 million will have this chronic disease epidemic. Um, this is Dr. Michelle uh, Perro's data. This is actually uh, from Academy of Pediatrics. Um, more than 50% U.S. children already have chronic diseases. Now, what are chronic diseases? Chronic diseases are diseases lasted more than six months without um, treatment, um, healing treatment. Basically, you are supposed to be taking a drug for the rest of your life. 21% are already developmentally um, disabled, which is really concerning to us because they are the workforce for our future and they are already disabled. Um, this is a chronic mental and chronic pain disease uh, in America is rising. This is uh, a survey by the disability payment system. And you can see Americans are claiming chronic pain disability together with mental disorder dis disability, rising very sharply right around 1997, where GMO food are released in uh, our life and together with the EMF I also. Uh, opiate overdose is becoming pandemic. Um, we lost 69,000 people last year to opiate overdose alone. Uh, these 69,000 people are not, uh, you know, drug addicts. They are actually working American white male. Um, this is the uh, male, what's going down, what's going up. Well, what's going up is male infertility. Um, you can see Europe, it's actually not great um, when they, when they come down to male inter infertility. What's coming down, this is the tes testosterone level measured in different decades. Um, the longer we're closer, the closer to today, this is 2002, 2004, uh, we don't have data for the recent, but we're seeing this drastic 50% decrease in testosterone level in male. Um, obesity is rising. As you can see, according to American uh, Diabetic Association, 50%, uh, not 50%, uh, yeah, 50% of uh, Americans will be actually obese. This is very, very shocking and, and frightening because we know obesity are not just a um, you know, regular thing. It doesn't look good. We're, we're talking about major metabolic inflammation and major multi-system disease. And this trend is very, very important uh, if you see um, the obese woman actually rising in a double amount of weight uh, compared to over, overweight seems to be kind of uh, not as severely uh, alarming. Same, same thing with obese men. You can see the obese man was 10% and now it's reaching almost 40%. So again, we, we need to see this. Uh, it's a serious disease issue. And of course, who gets cancer? One out of two women 
will face diagnosis cancer in their lifetime and one of the three men. This is based on American Cancer Society. Apparently this number also apply to Canadians and United Kingdom. Now, 10 of the type of cancer are rising today are related to obesity. So who are the colon cancer group you're affecting? This is a very, very shocking. I spoke to um, gastroenterologists. They talk about the behavior of colon cancer and rectal cancer in young people are completely different from the old people getting colon cancer. These cancers are very, very aggressive. By the time they're discovered, they're already late stage and metastasized. So we are facing a national emergency if you want to save some of the young people's life because these aggressive colon cancers are very, has, carries a very high mortality and fatality rate. So of course, neuroinflammation. So um, I think we're going to talk about that in the, in the next, next section. So back to you, Rachel. Thank you. So uh, I want to take that information and I think it's really important that people review this and understand exactly what are causing these problems and know that this is not just happening in adults, it's happening in kids. So Michelle, uh, would you be able to talk a little bit more about what's happening with your patients? Yeah, you know, you saw the dismal projections from Dr. Liu, and I'm going to share some depressing stuff about kids too. Um, maybe people, you know, don't want to get them overwhelmed with depression because we have enough things going on, kind of making people a little upset right now. But I think we open the wound, air it, and let's share the bad news and deal with it. So let's start with sick is the new normal, right? Most kids have stuff and they think it's normal. Kids with asthma, allergies, eczema, they think that's normal. For example, one out of six African-American children, one out of eight white kids, Latino kids, it varies one to six, one to eight, have asthma. Asthma is not a benign disease. Eczema on the rise, 60% of babies now have eczema. Um, rates are also high in other countries like China. I want to hone in on that obesity issue as well that Chen Hong talked about in, adult, in adults and kids. It's also similar. One in five to one in three kids is now obese, but it depends on what state they come from. It's state variable. So one of the fattest states in America is West Virginia. And as Shen Hong and I love to talk about, the movie Dark Waters um, highlighted for many Americans the um, role of DuPont and dumping um, uh, PFO. PFOA and perfluorinated compounds, Teflon compounds into the rivers of West Virginia and Ohio and, and that entire region causing a tremendous amount of endocrine disruption and cancer and obesity. Obesity is an endocrine disorder. So, and we know that there are sequelae of obesity in kids as well. Everything from metabolic syndrome to high blood pressure to cardiovascular disease and bullying. Kids who are obese have a higher rate of bullying. So the whole thing is a mess. So then I, I wanna talk about mental health because mental health, particularly now in COVID time, because I've been speaking to colleagues and they have told me that the rates of mental health complaints are going sky high, not just among teens, where about 46% of teens have mental health complaints, but younger children. And they're manifesting as anxiety, depression, and sleep disorders. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sleep disorders now. Sleep is crucial because that's when your immune system repairs itself is during sleep. You have a little system called your glymphatics, cleans and sweeps things up, mops them out. And if you're not sleeping, you're not cleaning up and get, getting rid of toxins and toxicants. So who's not sleeping? Well, I can tell you 20 to 40% of children have a sleep disorder. That's huge. Now, if you look at kids with autism, ASD, autistic spectrum, I'll just call it autism for sake of brevity, 80% of them are not sleeping well. When you have a disrupted family from sleep deprivation, oh, there's, there are evil people, right? Sleep deprivation makes you crazy, makes you evil. So child's not sleeping with the condition. Siblings aren't sleeping. Mom and dad aren't sleeping. They start fighting. The whole house of cards falls apart. So I really like to focus on sleep. ADHD, that's another 10% um, of kids now are with ADHD. So I can tell you an ADHD, three or four kids don't sleep well with ADHD. It might be from the pharmacologics that they're on. It might be for other reasons. Screening, screening can, you know, decrease your melatonin. You don't sleep as well if you're gaming right before you go to sleep. And four of five adults with ADHD 
also don't sleep well. So we have an epidemic in addition of non-sleeping. Now, sleeping may be even a neurologic issue because small children often don't report neurologic disorders the same way adults do. So there are things that happen in kids like sleep disruptions that may signal that their neurologic systems aren't working well. Now, what I really want to hone in our conversation today with Rachel is autism. And there was, even since Dr. Adams and I wrote that book, the rates of autism have increased since. Uh, we are now about one in 53 kids. The stats are, I've read different places, one in 23 boys. So that is the curve that we need to flatten. COVID, sure. Autism, even more important because by definition, it's an epidemic. We are in now a global epidemic of autism. So this is why Neuroinflamed Nation, and maybe during this conversation, we'll start to elucidate why that is, what's causing it. But that is the statistical lay of the land. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I think one of the things maybe to clear up for the audience mm -hmm. is what really is the definition of a neuroinflammation nation? What is that? What does that entail for, for the people of America, of Canada, of those being affected by, by these very issues that we're talking about? We can start with Dr. Lee first. Yes. So um, let me see if I can get uh, the slides back. Okay. So uh, since we have so much to cover, um, I think the big thing is really about um, you know, we are watching the consequence of inflammatory uh, disease and its consequence of them, such as stroke, migraine, dementia, and Parkinson's disease. Migraine is becoming so prominent. I'm getting migraine uh, emails from pharmaceutical company almost daily. And uh, stroke is uh, definitely very, very concerning. Nobody wants to sit around in life, you know, for 20 years after had the stroke. Um, the other things underlying here, uh, of course, the, in kids where we, we see a drastic increase of ADD, um, autism, and um, neuroinflammatory issues. But in adults, these people that are taking care of these kids, um, oftentimes like moms, are having trouble with anxiety, depression, insomnia, ADHD, and dad is having a lot of anger and confusion. Um, one of the other symptoms of neuroinflammatory is apathy. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about apathy because it appears these people are very, very detached, but they actually, because their brain can't deal with it, they have to turn everything off. So they're, if you look at their face, they look very flat and, 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 and caring almost. But that's really their their coping mechanism now because they are um, they're they're just they just don't care. So what is neuroinflammation? Neuroinflammation is the nervous system's response to a variety of uh, cues such as infection, traumatic brain injury, toxic metabolites, autoimmunity. In the central nervous system, including the brain and the spinal cord, microglia are the resident innate immune cells. Oftentimes, they have to act. Uh, in response to these cues. Blood-brain barrier is supposed to be a specialized structure composed of astrocytes and endothelial cells. They're supposed to keep our brain safe, but we are often seeing a compromised blood-brain barrier to start with. Together, we also discovered from the gut to the brain, there's a shortcut, which is through the vagal nerve, and that's oftentimes carry chemical symptoms as uh, chemical messages to the brain directly uh, without having to be stopped by blood-brain barrier. We also discovered the eyes and also the smell are all places we can access the brain without going through the blood-brain barrier. So now we're seeing a lot of more issue because all the blood-brain barrier, the gut, uh, even the eyes and the, uh, the smell are um, compromised due to the neurotoxins. The response is initiated to protect the central nervous system uh, from the immune system. Uh, it's actually doing its job, but overreacting, overworking immune system created a lot of metabolic junk and also inflammation. So if you look at stroke and Parkinson's and dementia, we're seeing the tremendous increase in the United States here. Uh, this is uh, Parkinson's disease and also Alzheimer's disease uh, rising very sharply, attacking our whole world. Um, of course, the white and the black 
people, uh, black people has a like really steep curve compared to the white people. Uh, this is the internal medicine news has pre predicted if you are over 45 years old and you happen to be a woman, your chance of having uh, either a stroke, dementia or Parkinson's disease will be about 48.2%. Uh, this is actually very, very concerning uh, since me and Michelle and most of our colleagues are uh, over 45 years old. And so we are not going to see half of our uh, working class, you know, middle class are getting these kind of devastating diseases. These diseases not only steal our health, our quality of life is the most important. And also uh, conventional medicine absolutely have no treatment for these three diseases. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. And uh, now I wanna go to Dr. Perro and talk a little bit more about what your definition of the neuroinflammation nation is and how that's really affecting our gut, our brains, affecting children. So thank you. Thank you, uh, of course, Dr. Liu, Rachel. In children, this neurologic inflammation is manifested the same way with disruption that Chen Hong was talking about, the blood-brain barrier. The way I like to look at it in kids is it starts with the gut and the factors that affect the microbiota or the microbiome, which is the collection of organisms that live in the tummies. Now we, yes, we have these, these wonderful organisms that support our immune system. They're our first line of defense and in, in detoxifying foreign substances. Things that affect the microbiome affect neurologic health. It is this relationship that needs to be understood between the gut and the brain that is making our children sick and making Americans sick, and also impairing our immune function, making us globally immunodeficient, compromised, or hyperimmune. What's happening is several fold. Number one, the rate of C-sections. So a third of American births, I think it's highest in Australia, similar to Canada, are cesarean born, they don't pass through the, the, the vagina. They don't get the microbes from mom. Moms are the stewards of future health of the baby. And they acquire this diminished microbiome, which is what talks to the baby's immune system to set it up. Now, if you're not nursing, breastfeeding is how babies can make up for that deficit and get microbiota, the microbiome, that collection of beneficial bugs. If babies are fed formula, they're not going to get enough. If they're fed the newly developed, what's coming out soon, biomilk, I'll be talking about that soon. It's a, um, a, a tech version of breast milk. Don't even get me started, Rachel, on that. That'd be another Facebook Live. If they're going to be drinking that stuff, not the same as mommy milk. Okay. So then what if they are drinking formula, they aren't eating food that's not organic, they're getting a decent dose of glyphosate and glyphosate-based herbicides. What's the problem with that? When you associate that glyphosate with other heavy metals like mercury, like aluminum, like lead, where are they getting those from? Mom, mom offloads all those chemicals, particularly loads all those chemicals, particularly the metals on her firstborn. The water system, it's a big mess, lead in our water. I won't even mention the V word because God forbid somebody on Facebook might yank us off. So this is where all these heavy, heavy metals come from. Glyphosate loves to shuttle aluminum right across that blood brain barrier, which is impaired and activates the little cells that Shen Hong was talking about, those immune microglial cells, which inflame the brain. They're not easy to shut off once they're activated. We've known about this little glyphosate aluminum shuttle since 1993. I think I even saw a paper from the 80s. This is not new stuff. This is out there. You just have to search for it. So now we have all those new information going on. Glyphosate <laughs> study in May. What does it show? Glyphosate causes autism. Glyphosate-based herbicides. Causation, not correlation. Autism. Paper came out and it elucidated the mechanism by way that happens. That's big news. And what just came out this past week? shows how glyphosate impairs reproductive health. So this, we have been having, so they bring glyphosate-based herbicides. We've spent the past decades, plural, showing the neurologic impact via the gut impact. We know that glyphosate impairs this microbial community. Major is effective as an antibiotic. Be clear, folks, we are eating daily antibiotics in our food patented by Mon Bear, that was I'm calling it now, Monsanto, now Bear, 
And we now know via the work of my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Antonio and his group in King's College in London, exactly how that happens. So we even know the mechanism of how this is all happening. And yet we're all eating this stuff. You impair the gut, you impair the brain, the enteric nervous system, that vagus nerve that Chen Hong was talking about, as well as via the leaky gut. Our kids have these inflamed leaky guts. Those toxic things are crossing across these leaky guts, stimulating um, various cells in the blood, causing chronic inflammation, and hence the cycle begins. So we have a nation of chronic inflammation. Thank you, Michelle, for that. I think that's really an insight into what is causing this neuroinflammation nation. And it gives people a more clear picture on what is really harming our children. And I, I think I want to jump back to Dr. Liu on this a little bit as well, because um, we did talk about these increases in neuroinflammation. But Dr. Liu, what do you think is causing the rise? Okay. So, um, you know, you, I think the big thing is, you know, when people um, are ignoring the two elephants in the room, it's really not uncommon actually uh, because people in the food group focus on the food uh, people uh, focus on the exercise and stress and meditation uh, yoga group uh, they focus on stress right I think what's really interesting is to if you look at what has drastically increased in the past 15 to 20 years are definitely GMO food now, when I did this uh, first talk in, about GMO food in China, uh, people are very, very confused because they saw the GMO food are made to resist mold, to resist drought, to feed the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's all these promises that seem to be uh, appropriate. But it turns out 96% um, GMO food are made to be resistant to an herbicide. Uh, it's really uh, the way to sell a lot of herbicides. Now, unfortunately, this particular herbicides called the glyphosate-containing herbicides are um, the main issue. We have so much multi-system issue, okay? So what is glyphosate? Glyphosate is patented initially as a mineral chelator. I spoke to Dr. Huber. Um, he actually started studying it in 1974. He uh, concluded because it killed the microbiome as well as uh, chelate the mineral, it will be a disaster to be used uh, in the agriculture scale, uh, especially the industrial agriculture is large. So um, that's one of the reason is glyphosate is actually ecosystem killer. Now, the other thing is it actually can last for 20 years. So it's, it's actually part of the uh, forever chemical. Glyphosate without soil mediation, microbiome treatment, enzyme treatment can last in the ecosystem, which is our little tiny planet, for 20 years. So glyphosate is patented as a mineral chelator. You can see how detrimental that is for children who have multiple uh, mineral issues. Number two, uh, microbiome. It's an antibiotic. Now people say, okay, it's antibiotic to the soil, it doesn't relate it to us, but they forgot our body is actually more microbiome than our body cells. So my, our microbiome have so much profound effect on helping the epigenetic um, part of our life. It basically, our body is clueless without microbiome. We don't know when to eat, when to sleep, when to digest food. Um, you know, microbiome tells us everything. Microbiome can also uh, produce something called a microRNA that actually help us control cancer activity. So when we have those things missing because this antibiotic, which is basically in food, water, and air, um, is everywhere, we are really missing one of the most potent body defensor in the world today. So that's one thing I can uh, definitely elaborate with Dr. Michelle in a different uh, webinar. Glyphosate is bad news for everyone. It's not, bad, it's, not, it's not just bad news for us, it's bad news for animals, especially the bees who are losing 40% insects for birds, since birds are eating the bees. So I mean, not eating the bees, eating the insects. So very important thing. 
The second one is EMF. I think EMF uh, is definitely, we can all relate to that. Um, unfortunately, the damage on mitochondria and DNA uh, from these electromagnetic frequencies are accumulative and very slow. So uh, it's again, some of the things you don't see, like I used the cell phone, I died. Uh, it's not like that. It accumulates um, to damage our body slowly. So it's more like a global massive human experiment. We're now seeing consequence of adrenal fatigue, sensitivity, uh, mold become more sensitive to mold people are. So those are really consequence of excessive electromagnetic frequencies, which bring our body out of the self-regulatory mode. Um, it also bring, you know, this tremendous, we call sensitivity, neuroinflammatory nation. So back to Dr. Michelle, I'm sure she has a lot to say about that, about children's brain. Should, should I continue on where we're on, um, on where we're going with that? Absolutely. Yeah, the two elephants in the room, Absolutely. glyphosate and EMF. <laughs> so um, <laughs> there's a couple of things that I think it's important to understand, and there's a lot we don't understand, Rachel. But what we do understand is um, these. We keep we uh, Shen Hong and I keep resonating with the importance of this microbiome, right? You've heard this throughout this conversation, and the micro there is a over 500 species of these microbes in your tummy. There are fungi, there are, are bacteria, there are archaea, there are all sorts of types of organisms and they communicate with each other. And the, one of the ways they communicate with each other is through their own electromagnetic frequencies. And so when you impair this communication, and this is hot stuff, new research, et cetera, et cetera. When you impair the way the, the, our microbial community uh, talk to each other, you impair their function. Now, I'll tell you one group of organisms that really enjoy electromagnetic frequencies, and that's mold. Mold seems to grow, lots of good data, in the presence of EMFs. We are having um, a little bit of an epidemic of folks with mold sensitivity, mold issues, bio mold, mold toxin. And for those of us in integrative medicine, we are getting tons of lectures of people who are mold sensitive, and it's a very difficult thing to treat. So you see, we're st because of our changing environment, we're changing the terrain, we're changing our microbial organisms as well as the way they communicate. I mean, we keep bringing in new technologies that our physiology are unable to deal with. And so this impairs physiologic function. Dr. Dr. Lou and I practice holistic medicine, functional medicine, integrative root cause medicine. When understanding the roots of chronic disease, neuroinflammation nation, chronic inflammation, you have to go to the root cause. In, the, in what's happening with COVID, we haven't identified the root cause. Why is America so sick from COVID? What's the root cause? You have to understand it. You have to look at immune function. To look at immune function, 70 to 80% of it is from the gut. You have to understand the gut. What are the factors impair, in, impaling, impairing our gut? It's our food, the pesticides in our food, the environments that change our physiology, like electromagnetic frequencies that we are not accustomed to in our water, as well as our air. When we look at this environmental toxic overload and what we've done, then we have to understand we are out of homeostasis as organisms. And so what we're trying to do is rebalance the homeostasis, the chi, the vital force of, of who we are by decreasing our toxic load, which means decreasing the environmental toxicant load, um, improving our internal milieu, the terrain, as per, um, on, uh, there was a whole Pasteur, Bechamp theory regarding, the, it's the organism that makes us, us sick. Well, no, it's the terrain that makes us sick. It's both that makes us sick. If the terrain's not healthy, we cannot be healthy. If the goldfish bowl is dirty, the water, do you give the goldfish medicine, drugs, or do you change the water? And maybe you need to do both. But if the water is not clean, that little fish is not going to get better. So it behooves us to improve the terrain, internal milieu, external milieu. And the, one of the most important ways we do that is to decrease the allostatic environmental toxin toxin, biologic, toxicant, non-biologic load. Absolutely. I think that's a really incredible point of what you brought up with the goldfish is do you give it medicine or do you simply change the water? 
And we have constantly inundated our bodies with toxic chemicals. Glyphosate is on 70 crops. Glyphosate is in almost everything we eat, not just genetically modified crops, but things like lentils, chickpeas, oats, everyday foods that we are consuming and could be eating up to three times a day every single day. And as you mentioned, it is also an antibiotic. So in these times where we are seeing rampant disease and rampant pandemics, uh, we need to understand that we cannot be ingesting antibiotics daily. We will be building up antibiotic resistance. Um, so these are huge issues that you're mentioning. And I, I sort of want to get into a little bit more about what you do differently, the both of you. Uh, you focus on root cause of medicine. So perhaps you can explain that a little bit further. And I'll start with Dr. Liu first. Um, I want to invite everyone, uh, patients, community members, family members, and physicians uh, to start changing a paradigm. Uh, instead of giving a diagnosis, tell people what and then what to do, uh, let's stop there. If somebody come in with a symptom or you know confusing, um, instead of doing the what, doing the why. Um, so for example, we recently rewarded, uh, the jury rewarded a couple who had a, um, a non-Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosis three times in the past eight years. And uh, of course, the first time both of them had the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they went to the doctor and they treated it, right? So give you the diagnosis, treat it. So instead of doing that, they if they just stop and asking why, why? me and my husband both have non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And the physician, instead of jumping into the treatment and stop and ask why, why that's really important. Well, these two people continue to use Roundup in their, in their nine properties and got the cancer again in three, year, three, in three years later, right? Again, the same sequence of event happened. Nobody, not the patient, not the physician, not the person ask, wait a minute, why you guys are having the same cancer the second time? The third time they did the same thing. Unfortunately, they realized the Roundup, their favorite weed killer is the number one reason they are getting the, the disease. Now the third time, unfortunately they got it from the newspaper article about the lawsuit, okay? Now by then, the tumor has already attacked the woman's brain. So the same thing that we need to start doing. Uh, if you're a patient, demand the doctor to give your answer on why. If the doctor doesn't know, suggest the doctor to order you the environmental toxin screen, okay? So that's something I want people to start doing it because we are all rushing to save people's life and release their symptom, but none of us has the time or energy to, to look for the cause, uh, which is, there's a great movie called Living Downstream. Very, very- I think you cut out there, Shen Hong. In the meantime, we can uh, go to Dr. Perro and talk a little bit more. We'll come back to you, Dr. Liu, uh, to talk a little okay. bit more about that. But yes, go ahead, Dr. Perro. So um, what Dr. Liu is talking about is understanding root cause medicine. And so in order to, maybe we should understand, this is what we as integrative docs do as practitioners, if we understand the why, and that's where Shan Hong left off. And I think the, one of the best things what we can do is to help our listeners today to, to really change the paradigm, as Shan Hong said, is what can we do? You know, as, as, as even if your, your practitioner is not discovering the why, what are the things that you can do on your own to, to get to the root cause and not only change your paradigm of health, your own homeostasis, but prevention? It's much easier to prevent than to treat. We, we can treat autism, doable, difficult. I'd rather prevent it. And there are ways and things we can do that we can do prevention. And this is a public health issue, right? So what I'd like to just, you know, as we start to come to the end of this conversation today, because otherwise we'll be here all night, um, and I know it's late where you are, Rachel, is pre-pregnancy cleanup, okay? 
So before you even think about having sex, I want everyone to really start thinking about, well, gee, if we make a baby, will that baby have the best shot? So it behooves both partners to clean up and, and prevent some of these things by doing anywhere between six months to a year before conceiving is doing some cleanup. And like, well, what does that mean, pre-pregnancy cleanup? What do we do? Well, there's lots of resources. Madesafe.org, one of my favorite um, organizations, um, has all kinds of manuals. But basically, you go organic, completely organic, and that means your wine and beer too, just saying. You get a water filter, easy to do. Decrease um, your toxic load indoors by taking your shoes off at the door. Environmental health and all that. And we have great resources from various sites um, and uh, on how to decrease your toxic load. So we, that is what we're recommending. The next thing I wanna do is we see mostly women. Now we know women get more health care than men in general. And in my pediatric practice over the, over the decades, I've seen mostly moms. Where are the dads? I've been remiss. I made a mistake, Rachel. This is a call out to dads, to men, to step up. This is not a women's issue. This is a people issue. And I want dads to help take control of their own kids and their own health. I don't want to see women interpreting for their husbands in medical offices anymore. I think guys can interpret their own health issues themselves. And I want there to be partnership. And what we need more in this environmental health movement is a combination of all of us, not just women. And when we go to these health conferences, it's mostly gals. And I know women seem to be more, not to um, gender stereotype, more interested in health and education and children's health. That has to change like yesterday. So this is a call out. Maybe it's a call for action for dads to step up. And I think we start right now with this with this Facebook Live, and I'm asking the gentleman to please step up. So I think I will turn it back over to Dr. Lou as we start to, I think, wind down our conversation of maybe what can we do here so we're not left with a sea of, of doom and gloom. Dr. Lou Shenhong, if you're there, feel free to go ahead. Yes. Okay. So I think we are going to a uh, call for action. So what is the call for action? is we are going to um, ask uh, the three steps of action, okay? So I'm going to find this page. So this is, uh, this is what we're doing. So basically, we would love to get people tested. We have ways to test their urine, uh, their water. HRI lab has a direct connection with the GMO sciences. So if you go to gmosciences.com and you can get tested, your data will be part of our community and we will be able to support um, the next step. Now, why we should make talks invisible? Because when we don't make talks invisible, it's somebody else's business. If the toxins are not visible, it is not real, right? So when the toxins start to come out of your body, you will start asking, where, where did you get it? So um, I think that's one individual level and it's only like $99. If you have a parent, if you're a parent, you can do it with your kid for half price. Um, you, if you have a dog, you can do it with your dog. Um, so it's very, very important to do. Uh, for physicians, particularly, we, we have been getting quite a few physicians, you know, um, committed to do the test because they actually did get sick. Some of them have cancer, Parkinson's disease. Um, we just don't want you guys to uh, get left behind. So physicians are particularly encouraged to uh, donate their urine, you know, a $99 to get your urine tested. So that's the first box. The second box is we will, we are looking at one year as our goal to collect data and to really present this to our community. Now, why community is important. We can't change the country. We cannot change the world, but we can change our, our wallet. We can change how the community manage their lawns and school. We can go to the Ace Hardware Store or local hardware store and presenting our local data to these people and educate them about safe alternative. And one of the non-for-profit uh, profit organization we really love is called nontoxiccommunities.com. If you go there, you can actually start your little uh, grassroots group. Uh, why that's important? Because 
we are going to start with our wallet. Our wallet is the strongest thing to vote. If we buy the chemical, it will not be, it will not be eliminated. Trust me, um, because our country is actually business driven. Our country has the, the highest chemical registration compared to the entire world. Uh, we prescribe the most pharmaceuticals per year compared to the entire world too. So uh, in a, just because these products are sold on the shelf, that means they're safe. So that's something we all, I, I was kind of disappointed. I saw that, well, they should have the label. Uh, like 24D, if you guys buy 24D, you will read the label and they will say, they will say this can cause kidney damage, eye burning, confusion, stay away from it, do not spray when children are around, right? But Roundup, glyphosate containing weed killer, do not have that warning. So very, very dangerous. Uh, we cannot trust the government at this point to protect us because there's the, the EPA is definitely running out of money and resources. I spoke to two EPA previous worker director. Uh, they, to they told me, they said they just have so much report on toxic chemicals, they are, they're bombarded. So all they do is they shovel it into the file cabinet. So you really cannot wait for EPA to tell you if this is um, dangerous or not. The reality is, unfortunately, as of right now, that our regula uh, regulatory agencies are not protecting us, not protecting consumers, and not protecting children. And we need to make sure that we're all doing our best to uh, fight that, fight for the ability to have access to healthy food, have access to healthy environments, uh, be safe from these toxicants. And so if people want to get in contact with you, want to be able to ask how they can get involved, what uh, they can do more, uh, how would they get in contact with the two of you? Okay, so I have a screen here. Uh, they can email me at drlu at drlumd.com. They can also text me at, at my cell phone number. Okay, so we'll just leave that up for a couple of seconds to allow anyone who might want to write that down to go ahead and do so. And uh, Michelle or Dr. Perro, uh, how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Um, I just want to say a, a, a couple things on the heels of what Shen Hong was talking about is, um, you know, the 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 idea that um, we're going to be taken care of. That's a Cinderella fairy tale. So the EPA is decimated. Um, the guy, the, the the way I started off this conversation tonight was with the bio sludge. The guy who, um, the gentleman rather, he's a scientist who I learned a lot about biosolids from. His name is Dr. David Lewis. Was an EPA microbiologist wrote amazing papers and as an EPA tradition was fired when he got too close to the truth. As some of you might be listening to tonight know that when scientists speak out, we usually get fired or lose our careers. So that's been the trend, certainly um, in the government trend and certainly medical trend um, is for those of us who speak up or speak out or share our concerns, um, we got to get together targeted or um, personally attacked. So, um, the question I leave for our listeners tonight is what's the cost of convenience? What are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of convenience? Um, what I would recommend, um, you know, I've been executive director of GMO Science. That's who's sponsoring this event tonight. Uh, we are a science-based website looking at the effects of GMOs and pesticides on health. And we have a, a, a plethora of information, but it's more than that. We're many organizations, Rachel, U.S. Uh, Kids Right to Know, um, uh, GMO Free USA, GM Watch, um, Institute for Responsible Technology are all doing, uh, and many others, um, our U.S. Right to Know I Love, are doing amazing work in trying to educate and support your local organizations. If you can't support us, we're doing it. But rather than supporting us, I believe everyone needs to step into this conversation. It's no longer those folks. I no longer say, oh, just write the check. No, no, you need to step up. So Already, it was already a call to dads. We shook dads up. Moms are already doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So what else can we do? Well, there are groups like Environmental Working Group that have petitions going. They have one going on right now. I have it on the GMO Science Facebook page against PepsiCo, Pepsi Company, um, for all the glyphosate in their um, hummus and in Quaker oats, Sabra hummus and Quaker oats. Their oats have like 772 parts per billion of glyphosate. 
folks study 0.2 parts for building glyphosate caused, not correlated, caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, an epidemic in America right now affecting one in three Americans. Obese children have a very high rate of undiagnosed liver disorders that progress to worsening liver disorder, disorders called MASH, doesn't matter the, the, the acronym, but the, these folks who are sicker have higher levels of glyphosate. And that was another study that was done. Sign these petitions, make your voice heard, boycott the companies. Let these companies know that you're not gonna use their products if they don't remove glyphosate, both in their products as a desiccant weed. They use it off-label to dry crops. And who's at risk? Vegetarians. The highest rates of glyphosate are in oats, wheat, and legumes, a, a big part of vegetarian diets. And please stay away from that little nasty impossible burger. That's a little GMO burger. You can read all about it on our website, GMO Science. So there is a cost of convenience. I'd say, you know, cook at home, avoid processed foods, grow your own, support organizations, join organizations, sign petitions, write letters, let people know your voice. Don't be quiet. This is not the time to take the back seat. And if you need to reach me, you can go to Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E -L -L -E, dot GMO science at gmail.com. Or our, you can also get us through our website. Let me know what you're thinking. And we would love to share more information with you. We, um, Shan Hung and I are trying to create this national glyphosate uh, testing program, a national detox awareness, um, and getting everyone, including our neighbors to the north, our neighbors to the south, involved as a global community. This is not America's problem anymore. We now have a global problem. Thank you, Monsanto Bear. It's everyone's problem now. And so we have the power, and I've been kind of bashing on dads tonight, yo mom, moms spend 85% of the household budget. Ladies, <laughs> we spend the money. I, well, I'll tell you, I do. So where do you want to put your dollars when you go shopping? What you spend your money on matters. As my dear friend Jeffrey Smith said, there's an economic tipping point. When companies see where we're putting our money, then they switch because it's about profit for them and that's fine, whatever is floating their boat. But so it, it, is, it matters where you shop, where you spend, what you cook, this all has an impact. And then you model that behavior for your children. And that's where they learn. They don't learn by what you say, but by what you do. So be a model for your children, support, change, evolve. We're in for the marathon, not the sprint. We don't shoot for perfection. We shoot for change and document it on your iPhone if you have to it's for you little overachievers out there. And we're here to work together. So um, I think that's what I'll just wrap up with those thoughts. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perro. And I think that's a wonderful note to end off on. Um, we really have seen that this system that we are, are all a part of is corrupted and it is not benefiting farmers anymore. It is not benefiting the land. It is not benefiting children, doctors. Really, it's not benefiting anyone. It is making us, uh, ourselves sick. The system that is supposed to nourish our bodies is poisoning us and our children and future generations. So now is the time for change. We need to band together. We need to form a movement of food for health because food is medicine after all. Uh, so let's work together on that and make that movement possible. Please get in touch with us. Go to GMO Science. Uh, you can also contact Kids Right to Know, and we will all work together. We need to form a coalition of working on a better food system, on a better health system for everyone. Thank you again for joining our Facebook live stream tonight. It was such an honor having you all here. And let's do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Shen Hong. Thank you both. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.